and we're going to talk about Haircut Gate with Ben Roethlisberger. <laughs> Yesterday, you guys saw it. Marcellus and LeVar uh, nearly laughed me off the air, had my dear friend Isaiah Thomas laughing at me because I tried to compare Big Ben's haircut to the Civil War heroics, and I tried <laughs> to compare Big Ben basically to Ulysses S. Grant for getting a haircut uh, during this pandemic. These guys laughed me off the air. They didn't get my point. They had Isaiah laugh at me. So now I've come up with an analogy that I think they can relate to. I think this would be much more accessible to Marcellus and LeVar, and it involves one of the greatest TV shows of all time, The Golden Girls. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if you guys remember mm. The Golden mm. Girls, but uh, when fire, you're a Ball man. State educated like me, when you're a Ball State educated <laughs> like me, the Golden Girls actually came up with the uh, popular saying, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. Uh, not Franklin Roosevelt. It actually was a 1987 episode of The Golden Girls when Rose <laughs> had this irrational fear of speaking in front of people. And she had to give a speech at her aunt's funeral. She had to give a eulogy at her aunt's funeral down in the Bahamas. And then uh, Dorothy had a fear of flying and Blanche had a fear of being in a confined space with bald men. All of this came to fruition. They flew down to the Bahamas. Uh, Dorothy's afraid of flying. There's a bunch of bald men on the plane. And, of course, Rose is afraid to give the speech. Show plays out. The fears were all irrational. And I, I say that to LeVar and Marcellus. The Golden Girls tried to teach you in this very classic episode we have nothing to fear but fear itself, that we can't let fear control us. And that was the point I was trying to make, and I think as it relates to the coronavirus and the statement that Big Ben and his barber were trying to make is like, hey, we're moving past fear. And that's why I call them the black and golden boys. Of course, the Pittsburgh Steelers colors are black and gold. But to me, the sports world, has to move beyond this irrational fear that is being promoted by the media. And I think that those of us that get to work from the comfort of our homes and still get paid right now, I think we don't have the perspective of Big Ben's barber and other working class people who need the world to restart. And look, there is risk inherent in life and in living. And I'm not suggesting there's no risk of the coronavirus. I'm saying we're over the top with our fear and previous generations faced challenges similar or just as dangerous and kept functioning. And that's what I would like to see happen from the sports world because I think it's very important. The sports world is very important to our culture. They can be a leader. I like what Big Ben did here. It's just a small, subtle thing. It's not great heroics. But to me, as the sports world, we've overdosed on fear. And so I want to open back up the conversation and see if Marcellus and LeVar can see where I'm coming from today now that I've broken it down with a Golden Girls analogy rather than a Civil War analogy. <laughs> uh, has, the, has the sports world overdosed on fear, Marcellus? <laughs> No, they have not. Uh, only thing I'm getting from haircut gate is an overdose of ignorance or entitlement. One or both. You tell me. Uh, this situation, look, respect to the barber, respect to all small businesses out there, but let's not confuse who this guy is. He's just a jock sniffer who got caught up in Steeler Nation and wanted to compromise our nation for Steeler Nation and the opportunity to cut Ben Roethlisberger's hair in hopes that they can return to the Super Bowl because he touched the garb of the great Ben Roethlisberger. This is crazy for anyone to say this is even a small gesture of protest for small businesses. How? He didn't even take any money from it. If you're a small business who right now is desperate for the economy to open up, so you can make these transactions. If he's going to be a poster child for that, at least make a transaction from the rich and wealthy Ben Roethlisberger. But he didn't. 
And don't give me this whole protest that he was doing it to bring shine to him and this small business and his barber shop. Because we would have known who he was or the barber shop's name until he got the governor's rebuke. So I hear you in terms of the kernel of truth that you're standing on. You're saying, look, freedom comes at a cost. Liberty comes at a cost. Opening up this economy is going to come at a cost. But this is the wrong example to use for that message. Well, first, I'm going to start off by saying the backhanded compliment of taking it away from the Civil War is pretty creative with on your part, first and foremost. But taking it and making it another backhanded it, uh, compliment by comparing it to the Golden Girls, which, by the way, uh, Blanche was my first cougar crush when I was growing up. Um, but I do, I do, I do think he, I do think that the sports culture, the sports world has overdosed on Corona virus uh, fear. And I'm and I'm going to tell you why, because the sports culture is not afraid of the Corona virus. All right. The, the sports culture is is built on and bases. It's off of achievement, off of competition. So when I think of our sports culture and I look at how many guys are still exercising and still working out and going on going about their daily lives and trying to prepare themselves. I look at it from the standpoint of people are definitely overdosed by the fear factor because we all know in sports and sports culture, fear is not a word that you use unless you're saying I'm going to use it to drive me. It's a driving force. It's not what you build the premise and, and the, you know, the pillars of what competition and sports represents. I, I, I'm going to say this, trying to ju uh, jump off your point, LeVar, that there is risk in sports, in football, injury, uh, serious injury in football and some of these contact sports, uh, ultimate fighting, boxing, whatever. The, and athletes make that calculation of how much risk is involved in these sports. And all I'm saying is let's be driven by the data. And the data says, pretty overwhelmingly, young people, particularly healthy young people, coronavirus is not a death sentence. And so that also means even your children of these young athletes. The data says that it's not a real health risk for them. And so do I mean to say, let's go out here willy-nilly and just open things up? No, that's not what I'm saying. But we have overreacted to some degree, and all of this talk of no college football season and California, no pro sports, and I know Gavin Newsom has backed off, but I just think a lot of us that are in the media or celebrity athletes, we are so addicted to Twitter, and Twitter drives so much of our thinking and makes us interpret everything based on politics rather than just common sense. And so Twitter has made this thing, if you're for opening the economy, uh, you're a Republican. If, if you're against it, you're a Democrat. And people start making decisions based off that. Some of us are removed from politics. And my only concern is my dad was a small businessman in Indianapolis my whole life. My mother was a factory worker who lived check to check. These people that are going without right now, we have to stop this, and this is why I say sports world. We have to be leaders because we've always been leaders. Yes, there is risk. Some athletes may get sick. God forbid some athlete may die. But I still say we must continue on because the people that founded this country and set it up for us all to have the opportunity to live the remarkable lives that these three guys talking on TV are living, they made some courageous sacrifices and did not allow fear to control their attitude, behavior, or actions. And I just think we've gone a little overboard with fear. I disagree. Uh, the fear of reality can be substantiated by numbers. Uh, and as you're pointing to, there are numbers that can say that our fear is out of control. But the fear of the unknown can't be substantiated with these numbers because it's unknown where this could go. Uh, you look at China right now facing their second wave 
of the coronavirus because they opened up, quote unquote, too soon, whatever that date is. So you have to be very careful of the two different fears that we're talking about right now. And let's just be real about the sports world. I have underlying conditions. I am asthmatic. If I were active as a player right now and you told me I could go play, I have a real conversation to have with my family on top of other athletes out there as well. And this situation to me comes to hit me like it's not just about me, the athlete. Yeah, I'm young. If I didn't have underlying conditions, the 70, 80, 90 percent of the athletes who don't, it's about their families. It's about does my mother feel every hit? that I'm taking, every compromised situation I'm in. My grandmother, I'm putting them in harm's way when I go out there and say, I'm fine, but I'm not so certain you are. So it's a whole different situation when you look at these guys. And to the business owners out there, my heart goes out to you, but I'm also going to be real. As you said, our country was found on taking risks. Guess what? First rule of business school, they tell you most businesses will fail. They tell you that from hello. Now, if you don't want to accept that, you can walk out the classroom. But the point of it is, we're taking risks with our health, but you're also taking a risk even being a business owner. And you can't go out there now and, and get rid of or expire those same risks because you have different incentives or different desires. You know, I like both points that are being made, but I do tend to lean a little bit more towards and now and, and with this being said, I understand the asthmatic aspect of it and I understand the health risk and components of, of making sure you do things the right way, right? But let's be real here. Here's another reality to present. Okay. Guys okay. are still preparing for seasons. Guys are still doing their off-season training. As it, as it applies to sports, and we're talking sports culture, is it an overdose? It is an overdose because if you talk, I talked to a few people yesterday, right? They were laughing at our conversation and our topic of Ben getting his haircut. You know why? Because a few of them had already gotten two or three haircuts already, right? So we're talking okay, about right. people, the, the people that are really out here and, and they're competitors or they're, you know, you look at it from the business owner's perspective. I get that. But as a sports culture, they're already out. They're already out. They're already figuring it out. They're already moving about. So it's kind of trying to figure out how does that match and meet up? with what you're talking about with these people in their businesses with and, and Marcellus. But as far as a sports culture, it has been an overdose because sports culture is not accepting that we have to stop life because of the COVID virus. And listen, obviously, if you got a TV and you're looking at me right now, I have a pre-existing condition. I'm overweight. There's no question about it. I don't think the world should stop to protect me. If I get caught up, that's on me. I don't want life to stop for these young people. I defended Dak Prescott when he was out there working out with friends or whatever. I said, I get it. I was once young. Go get it, young man. I'm going to defend all these guys. And again, I think it's incumbent upon us as men, as, as athletes, we have to be leaders in this situation and we have to act on faith and move beyond our fear. That's just my point of view. Thanks for watching. Subscribe here to get the latest from the show. And be sure to check out more of the best clips from Speak For Yourself or go watch a few segments from our other shows on FS1.